Let's discuss how we would manage a patient who ends up with an intraoperative PCR during nucleus management and we have retained nuclear fragments. I was called to manage this case and this is what I found. There were two or three fragments in the anterior to the mid vitreous. I was told that there was a fragment that had dropped down into the posterior segment and clinically there was no obvious vitreous. So what would be the approach in a case like this? The most tempting thing to do is enlarge the section and yank out these fragments out of the eye. Now I chose to first inject some tricot into the anterior chamber to look for the presence of any disturbed vitreous which would then change the way I would manage this case. Let's now move to watching the surgery and understanding the principles of managing this case and most importantly how we should manage such a complication safely, efficiently so as to be able to achieve an optimal end result. Let's now watch how this case was managed. Since I'm fairly certain that I'm going to need to perform a limited anterior vitrectomy and since I was going to use a 20 gauge cutter, I enlarged the paracentesis incisions to give me adequate space for the easy negotiation of a 20 gauge cutter. Next, I inject 4 mg and 0.1 ml of diluted triamcinolone astenide to delineate the vitreous. After washing out the excess triamcinolone, this is what we found. Even though intraoperatively it was not clinically obvious to me, there was a significant amount of disturbed vitreous in the anterior chamber. So at this point, if I chose to enlarge the section and yank out those fragments out of the eye, I'd be dragging the vitreous further. So to me, this is a very important step before taking a decision of how to manage retained nucleus fragments. And now that I've found disturbed vitreous in the anterior chamber, I proceed with performing a limited anterior vitrectomy. And as you can see, I start with cutting the vitreous that is prolapsed out of the incisions. I then proceed to performing the anterior vitrectomy. Note how I first cut the vitreous just within the incision in the anterior chamber and finally stay in the area of the pupillary plane. You will now see how under direct visualization with the port largely facing me, I proceed with a limited anterior vitrectomy with an aim of cutting all the disturbed vitreous anterior to the fragments and which is present in the anterior chamber. Now we need to be aware of the fact that whilst doing so, there's a good possibility of the fragments further dislodging and moving into the posterior segment. And should that be the eventuality, we should let the fragments fall behind. And therefore, if you ever were to consider bringing fragments out to the eye, it's important to ascertain that there is no vitreous anterior to them. Because in putting in a vectus and dragging them out of the eye, you are going to pull on the vitreous base with consequences thereafter, which may endanger the patient's end result. Note how as I proceed with the anterior vitrectomy, the fragments seem to have moved into a more posterior plane. I proceed, however, to complete the anterior vitrectomy. I then proceed to recheck once that there is no disturbed vitreous by injecting some more tricord into the anterior chamber. Do note the presence of two more strands of disturbed vitreous prolapsing towards the incisions. Having noticed these prolapsed strands of vitreous, I proceed to cut them with the vitrector. As I should have possibly mentioned earlier, the settings used for anterior vitrectomy is a cut rate of 800 to 1000 cuts per minute and a vacuum of 150 millimeters of mercury. I then proceed to perform a peripheral iridectomy using the vitrector itself. And here's how it's done. Using a minimum cut rate of 60 cuts per minute and a vacuum of about 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury, the cutter is introduced into the periphery, turned downwards, and with a single cut or not more than two, an iridectomy is easily created. I then introduce some viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, and it's now time to inject the three-piece IOL in the ciliary sulcus. Prior to doing so, I check, with the help of two hooks, the integrity of the anterior capsular rim. Whilst evaluating this, I notice the presence of some cortex at the 7 o'clock position. Because we have performed a thorough anterior vitrectomy, I now proceed with the bimanual eye to remove this chunk of cortex. Let's now move to introducing the three-piece lens in the ciliary sulcus. In order to do so, the first step is the enlargement of the 2.8 main incision to a 3.2 or a 3.4 millimeter incision as demonstrated here. 
We now get the three-piece lens ready for implantation. The scoelastic is first placed in the cartridge that holds it. The optic is gently nudged posteriorly, whilst the wings of the cartridge are then clasped shut. Whilst the optic is then injected up to the anterior aspect of the nozzle, it is extremely important to always note the orientation of the tip of the leading haptic. A clear visualization of the orientation of the leading haptic helps us decide the way in which we need to turn the cartridge so as to get the proper orientation of the IOL during its insertion. With adequate counter pressure afforded by the Sinsky hook in the non dominant right hand, we proceed with the IOL insertion. Unlike in a monofocal IOL, the nozzle of the cartridge should enter within the wound into the anterior chamber to facilitate ease of insertion. Viscoelastic may need to be introduced intermittently to have a well formed globe. Now, since the pupil is small, it is imperative that we check that the haptic while it's being injected is in the correct plane, that is the ciliary sulcus. Having confirmed that, we proceed to injecting the optic, supporting it with the Sinsky held under it. After introducing some more viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, with the help of a Kuglin hook held at the trailing optic haptic junction, the IOL is then rotated within the ciliary sulcus. With the help of a Kuglin hook, the IOL is then centered. The excess viscoelastic from the anterior chamber is then washed out with care and caution. We need to not spend too much time doing this because you do not want any more infusion fluid to go behind the IOL and further hydrate the vitreous. At the end of the visco wash, I now introduce some air into the anterior chamber. Having done so, it's time to now suture the incisions. Prior to handing over the case to the VR surgeons, who will then proceed with the removal of the drop fragments by performing a pass planar vitrectomy and fragment removal. This brings us to the end of the video tutorial demonstrating how to manage a patient who ends up with a PCR and retained nuclear fragments with vitreous in the anterior chamber. I hope you found this useful. Thank you.